Well, uh, thank you for the introduction, uh, Dorothy. You you put it beautifully. Um, I actually did not meet George during my time at the University of Washington, but he was on staff there. And uh, he was teaching sculpture and printmaking, if I remember correctly. This was in the early 70s. And um, throughout the 70s, I don't really know exactly what the connection was. I believe he was exhibiting at the Pacific Northwest Arts and Crafts Fair. I did that for a couple of years. Um, and then, as you'll see, and I'll share with you, that there was, of all things, a cookbook published in 1978 that he illustrated. And I just was so smitten with the images that he created. Um, I, I had the boldness to uh, send him a letter, which we did back then. And this was probably 1980. 80, I'm thinking something like that, and um, asked to meet him and asked him to look at some of my work, which I am, I can't believe I had the boldness to do because <laughs> when I look back on it now, it was, you know, my sophomoric work. But um, anyway, he was very gracious and uh, agreed that I would come to his home. So this is the home that I went to of George and Ayami's. It's in the Mount Baker district. He lived there uh, until his death in 1997. And um, I remember going in the doorway and just to the right of the doorway, I think it had to be on a pedestal because to me it was larger than life size, but it was a full samurai warrior suit of armor. And I was, really intimidated by this. I thought, oh no, I felt like I was in a museum or something. Anyway, he was very gracious. He um, took me to a, a lovely room in, in their home. And as I say, was very, very kind in, in looking at some of my work at that time. And then he proceeded to take me downstairs, which is where his studio was. And looking back on it now, this is somewhat of an encouragement because um, here he is looking in, in his basement, looking at some of his sculptural maquettes. And this was not a large basement. Um, it was not a large studio. And it's kind of given me a little grace with, with things because I'm kind of cramped into a seven by 11 little studio and in my basement and uh, some pretty cool things came out of his basement and um, it was that is what it was he used his yard as well for some of his studio and this is very much the way I saw George that day probably similar in age to this photograph he um, he had a lot of um, chests that had different types of paper and, and different pieces of his work lay, laying flat in, in these drawers and different, um, different brushes and, and different materials out. But, um, you know, it like I say, it wasn't a real big, it was really quite an intimate little studio that he had. So in thinking about George and putting this this talk together, I thought to myself, well, what, what is it that we really want to take away from learning a little bit more about his life and, and his work? Um, and I think for me, it's, it's in both encouraging and inspirational that he, although he, he had an artistic bent from early on, it wasn't a clear line um, of achievement. There were some detours along the road for him. And um, he had to reconcile who he was in terms of his heritage, in terms of his ethnicity. Uh, he had some family issues to, to reconcile. And all of these things um, pulled at him in different directions. So, when he finally achieved a synthesis 
in who he was as a person and in who he was artistically, it really wasn't until quite late in his life, or at least his midlife in the 50s and 19, at, at when he was the age of 50 and 60. So that too has been somewhat of an encouragement to me. I'll restate a little bit of what Dorothy said. Um, and the course of the, the talk today, we're gonna go back and forth between uh, me reading a little bit and then showing some, showing some slides. So um, as Dorothy mentioned, he was born in 1910 and uh, lived almost the whole 20th century in Seattle, dying at the age of 87 at his home. Uh, he was Japanese American and he experimented in a wide variety of media as we will see today. He created work ultimately that was an expression of his unique life experience in the Pacific Northwest, as well as Japan and many other places that he visited around the world. He is best known for his sculptural work and for his fountains, but he was also a printmaker and a painter and most specifically for us today, a Sumi painter, particularly in the later years of his life. Above all, his work is a prime example of the subtle bonding of aspects of the Japanese and Puget Sound aesthetic traditions into a unified expression. Okay, excuse me, I'm gonna show one more little photo here. And this is another photograph from his, his studio, again, with some of the Sumi work out before him. I think he's actually doing some drawings, working on this little sculptural piece here. But um, anyway, there you have that. Did you take these pictures, Barb? These are from uh, a book, um, Martha Kingsbury, who's a regional art historian. She published a book in nine in the 90s anyway, um, that a lot of these are taken from. Um, so like Fumiko, uh, George at the age of seven uh, was sent back to Japan uh, to for his education. And he stayed there till he was 17. He's here in the, the lower left. His, his father was quite a well-to-do uh, businessman in the Seattle area. They lived on Capitol Hill, had a number of children. And when the kids went to Japan, that education really was quite Western in its focus. At the time, everything was about uh, European art and culture because Japan, of course, was just opening itself up to the world at that time. So. He, although we might think that he got a traditional Japanese education, uh, much of it was very Western in its in its focus. So um, he came back at the age of seventeen, then not not knowing much English at that point. He'd forgotten a lot of English. So he enrolled in high school um, in the Capitol Hill area relearned English, started to take some art classes, was encouraged by his art teachers in high school. But his father very much wanted him and expected him to take over the family business. Although George was, as I say, going to school and so on, he did have communication and he stayed with some grandparents at certain times. And he became very fond of and had a mutual admiration with this grandfather. Uh, and the grandfather had been a bit of an ascetic. He was quirky enough that he left home for a couple of years and um, went to learn calligraphy and the tea ceremony and these kinds of things. And so during the time that George was there, he developed this loving relationship with this grandfather and the grandmother that were quite um, rooted in the traditional arts and aestheticism of, of Japan. Um, he One of the first works of art that George did was this portrait of his grandfather. And the portrait 
hung in George's bedroom, um, literally in, until until the day he died. Um, I want to talk a little bit now about George's journey as an artist. As I say, he was encouraged by his high school teachers and all of that. Um, but for a number of decades, George really didn't consider himself a professional painter or hadn't really quite made that decision to become an artist. He was, he was working part-time in the family business in Seattle, and uh, his work reflected what might be called a series, a period of searching for artistic expression that embodied who he was. And he was not only trying to come to terms with himself artistically, but who he was in terms of his heritage and his citizenship. And I'll show a, a number of slides of his early work. And I think we can all be in, encouraged by them because we will see that a lot of what he did wasn't necessarily great stuff. He was just interpreting artistically what was around him doing sort of doing the best he could at the time. But it was a crucial time for him where he laid down the foundation of leaps of artistic development that were to come later. He didn't always know what he was doing. And that realization to me has been quite liberating, giving myself a little, a little grace in what I'm doing as well. He did some copying. He experimented in different forms of creative expression other than Sumi. He did work uh, that wasn't really quite together. And from that, I'm finding a little hope for myself. Again, he was close to 60 when his work really began to flower and the synthesis of his Eastern and Western philosophy that exemplifies his uniqueness and his greatness as an artist finally came together. While George is most well known for his bronze fountains, um, there was his return to Sumi work later in his life. And uh, he, he really left uh, some of the other media that he'd worked in earlier in his life. He, he dropped that completely. So probably around the age of maybe 30 or so, something like that, um, at, actually in 32, he enrolled as an art student in the University of Washington, where he experimented in printmaking and sculpture and began to be influenced by a number of uh, encouraging faculty members and also began to make connections with other young artists like himself in the Seattle area who are also working their way through a variety of choices and directions in art. He developed relationships which would be lifelong relationships with artists who were part of what at that time was called the Northwest School. Here we see him with Mark Toby, who is in the upper right. Paul Horiyuchi is in the front uh, left-hand side and George is in the back on, on, on the left. And this wasn't just that they would all the time just get, get together and paint or something like that, but they really talked about art and what they were doing. They shared their work with one another. And these connections seem to have been particularly important to George, particularly um, Mark Toby, Morris Graves, who were not Asian, but who had an authentic interest in the Asian aesthetic. Toby had traveled in the Orient, um, Morris Graves, was working at the Seattle Art Museum and uh, helping to catalog a lot of Asian objects and works of art and things. So it began to turn George's head back to his heritage and maybe realize that there was something more to what was going on in the art world other than his being enamored with Picasso or some of those Western artists that, that maybe there was something there in Japan or in his heritage that was worthy of, of developing. During the war, let me see, I'm going to go through some of these. Okay, so uh, this is Paul Horiyuchi. And I might add that there is at that Aljoya exhibit 
there was an original, and I'm sorry I didn't take pictures of them, but anyway, there was an original of Horiyuchi's there as well as an original Toby in that lobby. This is one of Paul Horiyuchi's and another one of his. This is at that beautiful hotel that's right across the street from the Seattle Art Museum. And another Horiyuchi. And this is a, a Mark Toby, and we can almost see that sort of calligraphic kind of uh, brush stroke that he's using here. And this as well is Mark Toby. Okay. So uh, the next phase of George's life is the war years. So, okay. so during the war, George was in the army stationed in Oklahoma, Arkansas, Texas, Mississippi, and also Minnesota. On weekends, he and his friends went to Little Rock to Negro jazz clubs, and he found himself immersed in the foreign culture of that region of the U.S. He also frequented art museums in these locations and was inspired by the bold new works that he saw. The years of 1946 to 55 may describe, be described as his years as the artist experimenter. Okay, you're gonna see a little bit of what he was looking at here and recording at that time in his life. Wow. This is from Minnesota. And this is his sort of ode to, to World War II. It was a, a sculptural piece that, that he did. One of the interesting things about his war years, he was a citizen, of course, but he had relatives who were not, who were interred. Uh, the business of his family, extended family, was um, confiscated, and even his wife uh, had family members, well, he wasn't married at that time, but the woman who would become his wife had family members in Hiroshima who, who were killed during that bombing. So, you know, these were all things that probably are reflected in this, this work of art. But he, uh, he was... I just a question. He was not in in the internment camps then. That's correct. He was in the he was in the U.S. military. Yeah. There's As one of these pictures just flashed by so quickly that almost looked like an the one in the middle there. Well, I think, uh, I think it was his um, army camp. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Out in the plains. So um, the army was the last detour through which. Sudakawa came into his full life as an artist. His life experience had prepared him to undertake the work of consolidation that would make a whole and focused art from the radically diverse cultural components of his experience. During the following decade, he became much more productive. He renewed a work, his work in sculpture and his association with architects. He expanded the range of his art's form and its purpose. He constructed a work life and a family life of deep commitment. And using the GI Bill, he went back to graduate school and said at that time, he made the decision that he really wanted to pursue art. So let's take a look at some of those artworks that he produced after that. A lot of these um, reflect uh, his experience in the Northwest. But again, I, I think we see a lot of experimentation, hesitancy, you know, he's not real certain of himself yet. Probably a Seattle area there. But again, every once in a while, I see something like this that pops in where he's going back to, well, Maybe I should consider something more contemporary. Or here we see the Cubist influence in his work. And 
and the beach seems to have been uh, kind of particularly inspiring to him. We'll see a number of pictures in the beach. And I, I don't want to lose you because we really will get to some Sumi work of his. Gradually, George was drawn more and more uh, to the idea that he wanted to go back to Japan. And um, in 1960, he'd passed beyond many of the former styles that he'd worked in and his experimentation turned to a different focused manner of work for that would that would that would ultimately change quite quite significantly uh, anyway he in 56 he returned to japan for the first time in 30 years he started making wood sculptures on the theme of obos which are pictured here and the name comes from um, a name that he found in a book that was written by William O. Douglas, who had gone to the Himalayas, and it was one of the dialects, uh, the word for cairn, and it was something that he kind of, it really resonated with him. So he started making a number of these um, forms. And even took them to two dimension into two dimensional work. It wasn't until 1977, I believe it was, that George actually went to the Himalayas. But these sculptures were kind of a pivotal point for him in putting together this central axis that was part of uh, the Japanese pagoda construction and some of his sculpture in a more modern or Western design. From this period on, oil painting and traditional watercolor were pretty much abandoned. He began to paint primarily in sumi ink with more opaque Japanese watercolor or sometimes with tempera. So this is one of the first um, Sumi works that he did after this time. And this is called Point of Arches. And you can just see the, the reference to the Pacific Northwest here and the beautiful brushwork that he's going to utilize for the next 30 years. He put back in, um, you know, some of a bit of the cubist styling and this and that, but always there's that very sensitive brush stroke going on. A lot of different differences in the variation of the form, the rhythm. He did a number of these um, works with Mount Rainier as the subject, as, as we'll see. This one has particular significance to me. He made it into a Christmas card, um, and we received a Christmas card with this image on it, I think in 1981. This is one of the works that he did, uh, or that were inspired by the trip to Nepal that he took in 1977. I think this is uh, Ama de Blom. Experimenting with different forms. I love the line in this that very that really thin little line there. And I think this was called this one Ross Lake, I think, if I remember correctly.
Okay, so it wasn't until 1960 that George's first um, fountains were created, and he was always working with um, with the Sumi work from probably the age of, of 60 until his death. But um, of course, the fountains are what he what he's really known for, and we can't not mention the fountain work that he did. His first fountain was created and placed at the Seattle Public Library, and more than 60 fountains would follow. It was his desire that the fountains be evocative and reverent, and he meant for them to participate in the symbolic quality of water all over the world, the purifying, cleansing, offering the water of life. Ultimately, water standing in relation to humanity and to life is the great containing cycle of all things. And these are just, just a few of them. There are, I don't know how many that are in Seattle. There are a number overseas. I wanted to share this because this is George working uh, with his little son, Gerard, who's in his early 70s now. And Gerard has become a sculptor in his own right. In fact, if you've ever been to I don't know if it's still called Safe Go Field or not, but anyway, uh, there's the the bronze mitt sculpture outside of the field, and Gerard uh, did that that work. And sometimes people are now confusing when you say a Sudakawa work, they assume that you mean Gerard. So you have to sometimes clarify. And here's George working with his his engineer that he worked with for a number of years on his fountains. So. While fountains were a huge focus of George's work, Sumi painting drew his energies also during this time and include many landscapes inspired by the Pacific Northwest as well as still lifes and plant forms. So the cookbook um, came out in 1978, I think it was. A woman named Judy Geis from Seattle asked him to do the illustrations, which he did very beautifully. So these are all from the cookbook. Also, there was a recent exhibit at uh, the Bellevue Island, no, Bellevue, Bainbridge Island Museum of Art. And I took some photographs when I was there that I want to share with you as well. That was just a, within the last couple of years. Okay. But anyway, these were all taken at the uh, Bainbridge Island Museum of Art, a retrospective of his work that was within the last couple of years there. Sorry for the reflections, but. So that was a combination of both his sculptural work and mm -hmm. his paintings. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and, and a number of um, older works on paper also. I mean, just really early work. I went to that exhibit too, and it was my understanding that these were works that were in the family. That's collection. correct. Yeah, yeah so it probably span mm -hmm. quite a bit of a, of time. Yeah. Now this gets into some work that was, you know, probably done when he was in his 30s and 40s. And then um, these lamps he was doing a bit in graduate school and making some furniture at the same time also.
That particular... one I remember it was, I yeah. thought it was so amazing. It was, it's quite large. I would say maybe three by five feet, something like that. And I think the title was something like cracked ice. Yeah. And and how he achieved this look, uh, mm -hmm. this almost three dimensional looking, mm -hmm. yeah, of the different pieces, just by the way he did the line. Uh huh. Yeah, I agree with you. This is Mount Everest, his rendition of Mount Everest, when he was in that region. It's more from the Nepal trip. Probably more studies for the cookbook here. So this is in closing, this is just a little story. This gate was actually um, constructed around, designed by George around 1970. And it's a gate at the University of Washington Arboretum. Well, within the last three years, the gate was stolen, if you can believe it. Someone came in the middle of the night and hacked the, the gate uh, and, and took it for, for scrap lumber ultimate, or scrap metal. Ultimately, um, it was found, but it was so irreparably damaged that there was just no hope of, of reinstalling it. So a group of friends of the family of the Sudakawa family and friends of the Arboretum uh, went on a fundraising campaign and now a, a replica of the gate has been reinstalled and it's back in its rightful position. So here's a picture of George that was Taken, I don't know, it might have been in his 70s, maybe approaching 80 there. There he is in that studio picture again. And then the final picture that I have of him is this one. So that's really the end of my little dissertation about George Sertakawas. That was fascinating, Barb. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. My pleasure. Did anyone else besides Kathy and Dorothy and Barb see the show on Bainbridge Island? I I saw it too, Melinda. Mm -hmm. yeah. Melinda, I was going to ask you, did you have did you ever have uh, George for a professor when you were at the U? Yes, I did. I had him for watercolor in about 1968. So. Looking when he was born, he must have been only about 58 years old. But he, but it was funny because I had never taken watercolor and um, I didn't know what he was doing. It was, it wasn't traditional watercolor. I thought we'd learn and a, he probably was using Sumi brushes. I don't know if that's when I bought a Sumi brush. I don't know. I still have mine from that time period, but we he invited the whole class to his house so we got to go there too but i remember it being pretty big his studio being fairly large but in that was 1968 yeah and i don't know how i got there because i lived in the u district and i didn't have a car so i must have taken the bus to his mm -hmm. house mm -hmm. but i was really loved his house that's mm -hmm. you know seeing his house and it was just beautiful, full of uh, natural objects mm -hmm. and that inspired him. Lots of stones and um, inside his house that he'd collected on the, you know, like just lined them up in, you know, graduated order. And I remember I got home and I mean, a few years after that, went to a river up in the Skagit River and collected round stones like that, like he had. and. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I, I remember just being lost in his class, but he must have been a pretty liberal grader because I, I got a good grade <laughs> and I didn't know what I was doing, you know, because he, his watercolor, he would just do a line. Here's the sky, you know, mm -hmm. here's the mountain, you'll do three lines. And it was like, oh, mm -hmm. well, I, I, I remember being confused, but he was such a kind, um, quiet, gentle person. Mm -hmm. I really liked him. Yeah, a lot. Sally, oh, yeah, excuse me. I was um, just say, 
it, isn't, it, isn't it refreshing to see some of his work that that really you know that, that was his own student work today yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I I remember I knew that he was quite a famous sculptor sculptor in mm -hmm. um in Seattle at the time because he, he had he did a that fount a couple fountains around that had oh yeah and he did it was the Seattle World's Fair was 1962 and he did some fountain and I went to that a couple times and he he had his fountains there and that's when how I why I wanted to take a class from him because of his fountain seeing his fountains yeah interesting by the way I remember he had the family had PSSA there one time his wife was there his daughters were kind of managing it and his son Gerard gave us kind of a tour of the uh, studio downstairs but he had this huge collection of traveling sumi ink brush little traveling set mm -hmm. i've forgotten what they're called mm -hmm. but they they had that spread out on this large dining room table wow <laughs> yeah they exhibited was a musician she some played, of those uh, things uh, at the exhibit vertical harp what's it called yeah. well that would be fascinating mm -hmm. how wonderful that several of us have Several of you, I should say, have had that opportunity. Yeah. So you can see how he has, how he touched people within the community that, and, and being open enough to do that, to invite people into his home. He was very and, down to he, earth. I mean, this is a pretty small group and, and how many of us had some sort of personal interaction or connection with, with him. It's pretty what exciting. year did he pass away again? 97 97 wow. wow. mm -hmm. so maybe we maybe pssa went the early 2000s i don't remember mm -hmm. it was a while back mm -hmm. wow wow that I was find it interesting the way he uses sumi ink mm -hmm. because it's not traditional at all <clears throat> you know you don't have the gradations of in the ink color it's very black it's like sort of a, a combination of the modernist Mm -hmm. His modernist um, yeah. influences, I think, it, but using mm -hmm. Sumi ink yeah. to, to, to do it. And and the type of color that he used, it was called Gansai, G-A-N-S-A-I. Yeah, Gansai. Which, yeah. Is it a powdered watercolor? That no, it's, a, it's usually a cake watercolor. It's mineral mm -hmm. based, so it's yeah. almost like a gouache. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. thicker and the colors, the pigment is different too. I use that almost exclusively now in watercolor because I just love it. Well, mm. So did he. Here's what, it, here's what it looks like. Mm. Oh, where do you get okay. it? That's, that's one brand. And then the, the Marie's watercolors um, are that, that mineral based. This is a credit color set if you if you go on amazon or just google gansai um g-a-n-s-a-i tambi t-a-m-b-i you'll find um sets of 12 36 48 mm -hmm. and they also the bigger ones also include the wonderful metallic gansai oh. which is is really a strong gold and silver and white and they don't um they don't bleed like like um western watercolors they you know put them down and <laughs> you put them down and that's where they sit oh that holds so, the pigment pretty well yeah okay. and they but they all they mix really well so you can get a million colors with them any more questions let me check well i wanted to show you this is one of the things i did at my retreat this summer I don't know if you can see that, but you can see how strong the pigment is, mm -hmm. how beautifully it blends with a little bit of water. It's just really, mm. really, it's almost like, um, for those of you that have used gouache, it's almost like using gouache. A yeah. oh. little more opaque. And it, but it does, it does make great prints, um, oh. be better than watercolor. If you're, you know, if you're making prints at home. Well, I think it's because the pigment comes through so strong. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. 
but you can water it down and use it like a very transparent watercolor as well. Yeah. Are, are they the same as the Chinese um, dried paint like that? Cakes of paint? The pan, they're pan. Yeah. Well, the ones that yeah, I the pans, always use yeah. are pan watercolor. Yeah. yeah. They, and well, Melinda, they they do work. They do work like that more than um, they, like that little round, the little round hockey pucks. Is yeah. That yeah. They, they, yeah. 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 Here's here's another one, so you can see this is more mm. transparent. Yeah. So it it blends really nicely. Fun. Did you draw? Did you draw the flowers with a pen? Or did you use a brush? I use the Fudenosuke brush pens. Oh. Absolutely, the Tombo Fudenosuke. I just love those because it's like drawing with a very fine sumi brush. And it's you're familiar with those, right? Um, they look like, like this. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've just this, uh, this there's a blue one and a black one. The blue one is a much finer point. And I don't know if you can see it again, maybe against the white here. Yeah. yeah. A much finer one. And the black is a little more or a little less resistant, but it's still very fine. I use this for all of my very small brush calligraphy too. Oh, really? Wow. But I'm talking about Western calligraphy, not not my not Shodo. I'm not a yeah. so, so brush lettering for brush yeah, lettering for brush lettering very I small exactly. I use it on envelopes and things oh. can you say the name of that pen again it is it's made by Tombo and it's the Fuden I'm not sure that I'm pronouncing it right but it is Fudenosuke F-U-D-E-N-O-S-U-K-E -E. okay and you get you get a set of two you get both the blue and the black um Hey, oh. them. Where did you order them from? I got them on Amazon. Amazon. Amazon didn't. I used to have to get them from Jet Pens. If you're familiar mm -hmm. with Jet Pens, um, but Amazon now carries them. Okay. And that's what I used for all of the the defining when I go around. Um, and and define the leaves. And when I decide to do that, a lot of times I don't do that, but this is the pen I use to do that. Is it water soluble ink? Uh, no, it's relatively permanent. Relative. I say relatively because I've tested it by running my wet finger across it. And if it's not completely dry, it will smear a little bit, but, um, but I use it on envelopes because I know it's not gonna run like a, like a regular water-based um, kind of brush pen. Thanks. So, any any other questions? Thoughts for the good of the order? It was yes, great. Thank you so much, Barb. Yeah. It was good. This was Thank wonderful. You. And I think I'd like to encourage us to get back to, if we have a few minutes um, at the end of a meeting, to share um, anything that you might have been working on. Um, it's always an inspiration to see what people are doing. It is for me anyway. Does, does anybody have anything that they could pull up? Um, I have a, <laughs> I have a wow. score that's too big. To put it what? Out. <laughs> scroll oh a scroll yeah. yeah well maybe for next time you could take a photo of it son and then you could share the photo sure it's on my facebook i already posted oh. uh, four seasons okay. four gentlemen oh that I did. well we'd love Most to see recently. that <laughs> we'll, go, okay. we'll go on to facebook and check it out yes it's on facebook i posted before i went to korea so that was about a couple of months ago. Mm -hmm. mm. So I'm going back Good. to do some, I like to do some horses. Mm. Oh. I'm interested in horses. So shall I see? Well, were you inspired by Carolyn Callender? Was that? Uh, even before hers. And of course her painting really added more mm -hmm. firework on that. 
<laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. yeah, that was was very inspiring. Yes, she was very inspiring. And I've been planning to do that about a couple of years now, but I just simply haven't started yet. Well, there you go. You're back from Korea. It's time to get out the brush. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> November. There you go. It's a good month to start for the winter yeah. dwelling, right. right? It is a good time to start. Yes. Well, if no one has anything more, um, I wish you I, all I could probably say that Lisa and and I are working on the show for ArtCo and um, uh, we should have, we hope to have the prospectus out this next month. And the theme is called Heartstrings. Oh, um, wonderful. Hmm. For February. So Perfect. It'll be for the month of February. And I think at this point, <laughs> I, Lisa sent me a note saying that there will be no fee to enter. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I hope that you will enter something. They have a nice little gallery. And I think if you read in the newsletter also, they have this space in the back of their store there that has a few shelves where artists bring in things they're no longer using. And you can bring in things. And if you see something there you like, you can just take it. It's free. Wow. The free exchange for artists. So you can, I got some really good looking brushes, brand new. Uh, they, so you can find all kinds of things. So it doesn't make anything art related can go, can be brought in and put on that shelf. And it's really kind of nice because then the artists get to, you know, uh, get something that maybe they couldn't buy or it's just a oh, nice exchange. I have an announcement to make. Yes. yes. Uh, the Geek Harbor Tacoma Community College show, we had two artists sold their work. Yay. One is Lisa oh. and Sarah Bowman. Wow. So there are two pieces were sold. Fantastic. Wow. Yeah. Wonderful. Congratulations, Sarah. I think Lisa left yeah. us already, but that's that's oh, wonderful. that's yeah. fantastic. So no, thank you. Yes. Thank you. And thank you, Barbara. It was really uh, inspirational. I, I hope it was, despite the yes. foibles. Thank you. Yes, for... it was. It mm -hmm. was very much so. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everyone. And I guess next time we won't be looking at the screen. We'll actually be face to face, which will be wonderful for a change. So mm -hmm. I hope to see if you haven't already RSVP'd to Dorothy, do that before November 15th. And I hope to see you all there. I'm looking forward to it. Okay. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thank Happy you. Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving. everyone. Take care. Bye bye. Take care. Bye. bye. Thank you, Barbara. Thanks, Barbara. Thank you, Thank you, Barb. Thank you, Barb.